Good morning. Welcome to Mass 261. This is Multivariable Calculus Delta College. This is Thursday, October 21, last session. Welcome to fall. I mean, the hours of darkness snuck up on us. Now, now we're clearly in this latitude got more darkness than lightness. It's probably just starting to be light outside. So today we're going to work more on optimization with Lagrange multipliers. There's really a slick method to, ma to maximize, to optimize quantities subject to conditions. We can use that to analyze things on borders. And we're going to open up the next chapter and look at multiple integrals. Uh, I'll say a word about this topic of multiple integrals and describing regions because the question has come up multiple times. You know, what's the proper way to describe a region? And so I'll give you just the very simple example that we used in class last time where I had a triangle, right triangle, based at the origin with vertices at the origin and 0, 4, and 5, 0. And the question was how to describe this region. And for the purposes of graphing, I described it x is greater than or equal to 0, and y is greater than or equal to 0, and 4x plus 5y is less than or equal to 20. Now that does properly describe all the points in this region here. And Mathematica allowed me to graph the surface above this region with this instruction and the region function command. We illustrated that in the lecture last time. Uh, in Mathematica for and we use double and symbol like that. That's one of the quirks of Mathematica. But we could also describe this region as let all the x's be considered between 0 and 5. And then for each x between 0 and 5, let the y's run until I reach this line. So every x between 0 and 5, I draw a vertical line. Then I have to describe this vertical line. The vertical line begins when y equals zero. That's not hard to do. It ends on this line right here, which I have described, 4x plus 5y less than or equal to 20. But uh, to write that in terms of y, I solve this for y, I say minus 4 fifths x plus 4. This is also a way to describe this region. Now, this is an explicit description. This is a parameterization. And this right here is a system of equations. Get rid of this symbol. In the first case, I say collect all the points that satisfy all these equations. In the second case, I'm giving you explicit instructions for how to draw or to paint this region. And now the question is, which one should we use in which case? And I, and I note other parameterizations are possible. And we could say, I will let the y's run from 0 to 4. And then from every y between 0 and 4, I'll let the x's run horizontally. And the x's begin at x equals 0, the vertical line. They end on this line. If you solve this line for x, what do you get? Minus 5 fourths x plus 5. I could give other parameterizations of this too. And this relates to a question that came up 
on the exam. So one convenient way to parameter this might be radially. I could say, let theta run from zero to pi over two. And then my task is to describe every R that I could encounter as I go from zero to pi over two. I could still use this equation, x, five y, four x, five y equals 20, because I can write that equation in terms of x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. I could factor out the r. I'm writing too small here, acknowledge that. But this gives me an inscription of r in terms of theta. So I could run r from zero to this line. And this line is described as 20 divided by four cos theta plus five sine theta. So I want to acknowledge the excellent question I received, which was, how do I choose among these? When is each one of these sufficient? Or when is each one of these appropriate for the job? That's the question. And we will begin to discuss this now when we talk about multiple integrals, because we will have to physically describe regions and we'll have to be very careful that we describe the regions accurately. But first, I just want to notice this two styles of describing this region. And we will explain which one is the appropriate one to use at either time. But uh, this, this question related to an exam question where you were to ask to describe a tetrahedron in space. And you might recall the question. So, I will discuss this in more detail later, but I just wanted to first acknowledge that question and say that it, that was a very useful question. Okay, let me show you what the concept is for Lagrange multipliers. Exactly, I'm gonna try to adjust my camera here. I showed you how I set up this camera one day, just some uh, 14 gauge wire, household wire that I bent into a frame. It's kind of wobbly and insubstantial, but it's flexible. You know, kind of like the MacGyver of vector calculus. And I'm not talking about the new MacGyver. No, no, no. The new MacGyver doesn't hold a candle to the old MacGyver who could break out of a uh, maximum security facility with just a couple of grains of sands and a toothpick. Okay. What is the method of the Lagrange multiplier? Let me illustrate that with a very basic example. And I choose a basic example because we can see the things that are happening and then we'll apply it to a fancier problem. Let's say I wanted you to maximize the value of the function f of x and y is four minus x squared minus y squared, subject to the constraint x plus y is two. That's a very Simple sentence to understand. I want you to make this function as big as possible if you stay on this line. And even visually, it's not hard to follow. We might work up a Mathematica visual on this too. But what's the most efficient way to do this? Let's think about what's the most efficient way to do this. I'll try to draw 
a reasonable view of this, but I don't think we're going to get a beautiful view of this unless we appeal to Mathematica. But you should always try to draw things just casually to see if you can view them first. You might have to revise your drawing after a while. So this is a surface. It's really based on circles, isn't it? Every time x squared plus y squared is equal to a constant, I'll have four minus that constant. So if x squared plus y squared is zero, I'll have the value four. Let's put the value four right here, arbitrarily. If x squared plus y squared is equal to one, I'll have the value three. If x squared plus y squared is equal to two, I'll have the value two. If x squared plus y squared is equal to three, I'll have the value one. You see what's happening is that the level curves of this function are circles. And this is just an upside down elliptic paraboloid. If x squared plus y squared is equal to four, then the output is zero. And so that gives me circle of radius two, circle of radius two. I'm drawing it in perspective. I'm trying to draw it in perspective. Here's my circle of radius two. Drawn on top of the table, which is the xy plane. And here's the z-axis. And I have, if I block out x or y, just natural parabolas. I'm not going to, I'm going to stop trying to draw super accurately and just try to draw reasonably. Grab this this way too. And level curves that are circles. Of course, I could add as many level curves as I want. What about the constraint x plus y equals two? Well, I need to understand that in two forms. First, let's understand it in the xy plane as a line with x and y intercepts of two. And we've already identified that the circle also has x and y intercepts of plus minus two. So I can draw this line across those intercepts just like this. But I also visualize x plus y equals two as a plane. Since the z variable does not appear, z is free to be any very, uh, value I want. So this line slides up and down the space parallel to the z-axis creates a plane. And this plane acts like a chef's knife that slices this gumdrop, which is the elliptic paraboloid. And you can visualize the slice. I think you can visualize the slice as almost being, it appears to be possibly parabolic itself. Now I'm not gonna make any commitments to exactly how high or what shape, but it seems reasonable that when this knife slices this gumdrop, I get this parabolic edge to what I cut. So what is the maximum value of this function on this line? It appears to be at the apex of this parabola. In fact, if I solved this constraint, either for x or for y and substitute in here, well, then I just have a traditional calculus one problem that I don't think would be too hard to manage. But I want to illustrate something else. So let's look at this image. Let me tear off this sheet. Let's look at this image rather from above. I don't know where we're going to slide this one into. Let's, I want to keep the image on there. I'd like to keep the problem on there. Let's see if I can start another image over here. And in this image, I'm going to be strictly looking downwards at the xy plane. And I tell you how I'm oriented to the xy plane with my positive arrow so you can 
get some visualization, right? And then I tell you that I'm going through this line, x plus y equals two. Do not be distracted that I used three boxes here. I'm not trying to draw super accurately, just reasonably accurately. And I call that value two. So each box apparently is worth what? Two thirds of a unit. It's kind of a strange choice. But I'm looking at this from above. And now let's look at the level curves of this elliptic paraboloid from above. Of course, the circle of radius zero, we don't deserve to call that a circle. The circle of radius one from above, the circle of radius two. from above. Uh, that's not quite tangent to that circle, I don't think. I think that probably, well, that's a good question. Is that the circle that's tangent? Oh, that, oh, by, by the way, see, yeah, okay, so this is the circle of radius two thirds, isn't it? This is a circle of radius four thirds. Here's a circle of radius two. Yeah, too clever for my own good. I'm too careless for my own good. Circle of radius two has three boxes attached to the radius. And remember, these are altitude lines on the mountain. So this is the zero altitude line. Uh, let's follow my thing to its conclusion. If this is x squared plus y squared equals two thirds, and four is 12 thirds, uh, two thirds radius is four ninths. X squared plus y squared equals four ninths. When I have a two thirds radius, and four is how many ninths? 36 ninths. Subtract four ninths. Something is not smelling good here. So let's write down our circles explicitly. Two thirds is that smallest circle? X squared plus y squared equals four thirds is that in between circle. Now, now I am sliding off the paper, x squared plus y squared equals six thirds is the circle of radius two. So if x squared plus y squared is equal to four thirds, that's 16 over nine and four naturally is 36 over nine. So 16 over nine minus uh, sorry, 36 over nine minus 16 over nine is what? 20 over nine. So there's the height on that circle. If x squared plus y squared is four ninths, and this is 36 ninths, then this height is 32 ninths. Of course, this height is four. So as I'm ascending this mountain, I'm gaining altitude. I drew that too small. But the concept is this, as I'm ascending this mountain, I'm gaining altitude. And I really want to know the highest altitude line, the highest altitude curve, the red curve that this green line touches. Because when this green line touches that level curve, then this green line has reached its maximum height. Well, let's think about this in another way. Remember the gradient is always normal to level curves. So we think of the gradient as the universal tangent maker. We could think of normal vector to this green line. I'm not drawing any particular length. I'm just drawing normal vectors. But we could also think of normal vectors to the level curves of the paraboloid. They look like this. Oops, that doesn't look quite normal, does it? <laughs> and what I want to know, notice what happens at that moment where the green line touches its highest altitude circle. the green arrows and the red arrows line up.
And this is the observation of Lagrange that at that moment, these two normal vectors may not be the same. You know, one may be longer than the other. But at that moment, these two normal vectors have aligned. Depending on where the normal vector is, it could align in a positive or negative fashion. So let's write this in a mathematical form. Lagrange's observation. Do some history searching. Was it his, his alone, or was he first? Or was he just honored with his observation? Was that the two normals are parallel, not equal necessarily, but parallel. And one normal is given by the gradient of the function that we were given. And one normal is the normal vector to this line. Well, think of this line as a function itself, as a level curve of itself. G of x, y equals x plus y. Then this line is the level curve g equals two. Not that these are equal, but they are parallel, which means they differ by a constant. And the traditional letter we're using with constants at that time was the Greek letter lambda. And so this Greek letter lambda came to be known as the Lagrange multiplier. It was the scaling factor that made these two equal. Now let's see how this is going to solve this equation. And since I'm out of paper, I'm going to move this up to here. So I'll rewrite this very carefully. Maximize f of x comma y equal 4 minus x squared minus y squared. Subject to constraint g of x comma y equals x plus y equals 2. This is the level curve for this green line. And now I'm going to search to see where f g gradients line up. So this produces a series of equations. F gradient is minus 2x minus 2y. We've written the problem. We'll come back to the picture in a second. Y gradient, a G gradient is 1, 1. Not that they are equal, but they differ by the constant lambda. This produces two slotted vector. This produces two equations. First slot equal, second slot equal, but notice I have three unknowns. So negative two x equals lambda times one. Second equation, negative two y equals lambda times one. And now two equations, three unknowns, that's not gonna do, I need another equation. I pull in the constraint equation. X plus y equals two. So if I can solve this system of equations, I will find out when the normals line up. And when the normals line up, that could be the max or min of the system. Visually, it will be the maximum in this system. Now, here is the meat of the Lagrange multiplier problem. Solving a system of equations. And this system of equations is not hard to solve. But the problem we will have in general is the system of equations we get when we construct a Lagrange multiplier problem could be really messy, could be horrid, and it could be nonlinear. You're very good at solving systems of equations, two equations, two unknowns, three equations, three unknowns, 10 equations, 10 unknowns. If it's a linear system, 
this could be a nonlinear system. As this problem was written, I was fortunate that I came up with a linear system. Why? Because I was differentiating no more than degree two objects. But even that could get out of hand. I could get the lambda and the x and y multiplied together, multiple powers. But let's just finish solving this one, then we'll do a harder one. So I can solve this in a variety of ways, but I just want to be careful I don't destroy solutions. So I guess my first inclination here is to say, well, if lambda is minus 2x and lambda is minus 2y, then minus 2x must be minus 2y. And that means that x and y must be equal. And if x and y are equal and x plus y is 2, then 2 times x is 2. You know, x plus x is 2. That means x is 1. Since x and y are equal, that means y is 1. So what have we been directed now to check in our picture? And this makes perfect sense, doesn't it? We've been directed to check the point of 1, 1. Now the point of 1, 1 in this uh, oblique picture right here is right here. And that is apparently, yes, under the apex of the parabola. It's very easy to believe the apex of the parabola is at 1, 1. And the value of the function at 1, 1 is 4 minus 1 minus 1, which is 2. Now notice, by the way, that would be at a circle of radius. So x squared plus y squared equals 2. That'd be a circle of radius root two, which is 1.414 and change. It looked really close by scale with my radius of four thirds here. Four thirds here is 1.333, et cetera. So I can see why this circle looked like it was tangent to that green line, but I don't think it was exactly tangent to that green line. But here we go. We have maximized this function with respect to this constraint. You could ask, what about the minimum of that function with that constraint? Well, remember, this elliptic parabola goes on forever down. So on this green trail, we could go down as far as we please. There is no maximum, uh, minimum, absolute minimum on this green trail unless we further constrain the elliptic paraboloid like z greater than or equal to zero. Well, let's not focus on that yet. The Lagrange multiplier does what? The Lagrange multiplier finds us the moment when the gradients line up. And when the gradients line up, that's going to be a natural maximum or minimum. So this is the method of the Lagrange multiplier. Now, uh, you go back to my algebra work here. And you say, you never solved for lambda. Well, I could certainly solve for lambda right now. Lambda is minus two. But remember, lambda is minus two. Well, that was the construction that I gave. I invented the lambda to do this problem. Well, Lagrange invented the lambda to do this problem. So the solution to lambda is not necessarily the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem was the place where I had the min or max, right? So. Maybe as a fun exercise, I don't want to take the time to do that right here. What you could do is construct your elliptic paraboloid, construct your plane and line, and see if you can label that highest point and look at this from different views in Mathematica. That might be fun. Okay, now let's try a more difficult problem because while Lagrange's observation is beautiful, and reasonable, visual, pretty to look at, it could create systems of equations that are very difficult to manipulate, not obvious how to manipulate. So actually what I'm gonna do is go to a previous problem that I have posted on the website, and that is, uh, I'm going to pick something out right here. 
yeah, I think I'll do this problem right here because it's not unlike other problems you see in the book. And I was trying to get you interested in looking up my library of additional problems that I put into the uh, website. So I'll just say to you that this problem is in one of those libraries. It makes a great test question. So let's find, and then we'll see if we can draw this too. The points on the surface. Make sure I got my paper going on nicely here. And this I would call a medium problem. The first problem we did was just a basic introductory problem. It wasn't hard to do that algebra. That are closest to the origin. So I'll call this problem medium. It's not hard to describe. You have a surface here. You could even solve the surface for Z possibly, but you know that other surfaces are more complex and can't always easily be solved for Z or X or Y. It might be implicitly defined. You may not be sure what the surface is yet. Uh, you could draw it in Mathematica and find out exactly what it is. But certainly you believe since the origin, now remember the origin is zero, zero, zero. The origin is clearly not a point on the surface because when I plug in those values, I don't get one. Well, then I have something floating around in space and I'd like to know what part of it is very closest to the origin since the origin is not on that. It seems like a good physical problem. It seems like a reasonable physical problem. You say to yourself, oh, there must be a closest point to the origin. Well, let's do this in Lagrange language. So let's restate the question. I want to minimize. And now I'm going to move my paper up. I'm going to tear it off so I can work with it. Oh, I want to minimize this function, f of x and y and z. What function? What function? I have to look at this right here and say, this surface, isn't that the constraint? I must stay on this surface. That's the constraint that I'm using. I don't know what function I'm trying to minimize. Well, but before we tackle that, let's look at constraint. Subject to this function, g of x comma y comma z, which is x, y minus z squared, subject to constraint g equals one. So what I'm trying to point out right now is whenever you set up a Lagrange problem, you must be explicit as to what function you're trying to optimize and what function is the constraint. Here, the constraint is that I lie on the surface. Now, the moment you say this closest to, then you understand what you're trying to minimize. You're trying to minimize distance. And remember, distance is the sum of the squares of the differences of the x, y's, and z coordinates square rooted. But let's be clever right here. Instead of minimizing the square root of something, because that can get into some awkward derivatives, why don't I minimize the sum of the squares from zero, zero, zero to some point x, y, z on this unknown surface. 
Now remember the distance is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. x minus zero, y minus zero, z minus zero, that already has a convenient form. The distance is the square root of that. But if I want to minimize the square root of a quantity, since the square root function is increasing in one to one, all I have to do is minimize the argument of the square root function. Here's the argument of the square root function that gives me distance. So that's a kind of a little sidestep that's really useful to remember sometimes. If you're trying to minimize or maximize distance, you could actually minimize or maximize the quantity inside the square root. That saves you a lot of writing trouble. Okay, let's set up the gradient of f, which is 2x, 2y, 2z, gradient of g, which is, uh, let's be careful how we differentiate. With respect to x, we get y. With respect to y, we get x. With respect to z, we get minus 2z. And I want to write a system of equations with gradient of f equal to lambda gradient g. Notice that'll give me three equations, but x, y, z, and lambda, four unknowns. So I need a fourth equation. The fourth equation is always the constraint equation. Or the last equation, I could say, is always the constraint equation. So here are four equations and four unknowns. But this time, they will not be a linear system. OK, so let's set these two equal to each other. 2x is lambda times y. Two y is lambda times x. I'm reading the slots of this without writing it out. Two z is lambda times minus two z. And then, of course, the fourth equation is the constraint x y minus c squared equals one. The very first thing you notice about this system is that it is not linear. It is non-linear. Even though I do have four equations, four unknowns, I'm actually multiplying some of the unknowns, squaring unknowns. This makes the system of equations more difficult to solve. Uh, again, the theme that we're gonna use is we didn't really get to illustrate it on the one above. Let's not destroy solutions. You know, what, the, what is the Hippocratic Oath? First, do no harm. So let's be very careful how we manage the solutions here. What we're looking at is to build relationships, and we're looking for symmetry to build relationships. So you could say, well, let's divide by y to find out what lambda is. Let's divide by x to find out what lambda is. Then we'll set them equal to each other. Well, you got to be careful if you do that, dividing by x, dividing by y, because what does that automatically discard? If you divide by y, then you're no longer allowing y to be 0. If you divide by x, you're no longer allowing x to be 0. That's what I mean by don't destroy solutions. So instead of using the word division, Let's use the word factoring. Now, there are multiple ways that I can approach this factoring. But essentially, what I'm going to do is go through cases. As if I was examining multiple arguments. And once I'm satisfied that I've looked at every case, and got every possibility for a minimum, then I can examine all the results and see which one is the true minimum. You've got a question on your mind right now. You say, well, how do you know what you find is minimum? How do you know what you find is not a maximum? 
Well, let's think about the physical problem later, but let's just proceed to find these critical points, things that could be minimums or maximums. And what I notice in equation three, for example, I'm just gonna give you an example, is that if I write two Z equals minus lambda two Z, and bring the two Z lambda over to the other side, I don't have to divide by two Z and say lambda is minus one. No, that's not good because dividing by two Z is eliminating Z equals zero. What I wanna do is factor, I factor out. And do you see this gives me the same result? This gives me two cases, z equals zero or lambda equals minus one. So the style of pursuing Lagrange multiplier is the style of exhausting all your cases. Now I could have not uh, build cases on equation three alone. I could have looked at equation one and two and build cases. Let's multiply equation one by X. Let's multiply equation two by Y, both sides. And then I could set up two X squared equals two Y squared or X squared equals Y squared. That gives me cases. So then your question is like, well, which path should I pursue? How do I know I've exhausted all the cases? Well, the answer to that is, as long as you're pursuing legitimate paths to their logical conclusion, then you should exhaust all the possibilities, even if you didn't take the same initial path that I took. But because the Z was convenient to me right here, I'm gonna look at equation three. I'm going to factor out the two Z, and these will be my first two cases. Either z is zero or lambda is minus one. So now I gotta pursue these to their logical conclusions. Let's say what happens if z is zero. And the first equation is unchanged. Lambda times y equals two x. The second equation is unchanged. Lambda times x equals two y. The third equation just becomes zero equals zero. Well, it's true, it's not very helpful. And the fourth equation becomes x, y is one. This allows me to relate x and y and maybe plug that into equations one and two. So I might come back to that. Now let's look at lambda equals minus one. What happens to the first equation? Two x, is minus y. What happens to the second equation? 2y is minus x. What happens to the third equation? 2z is 2z. Well, again, true, but not necessarily helpful. Remember, I'm just working my way through cases. And in the last equation, if lambda is minus one, it doesn't appear to influence the fourth equation. So I'm gonna to have to pick this up and move on to the next piece of paper, but I just wanna show you how I'm looking at these two systems. You can approach whichever one you want to first, but I'm just gonna think about this graphically. Over here, I'm looking at z equals zero. Over here, I'm looking at lambda equals minus one. And I'm gonna look down this branch first because equation one and two, I can substitute in if two X equals minus Y and two Y equals minus X, I can solve this two equations, two unknowns by substitution. I'll put in Y equals negative two X right here. And that gives me what result? Well, this looks fancy and scary, but it just says minus four X is equal to minus X minus three X is equal to zero. I'm overworking this, X is zero. 
Now we got to finish this branch. If x is zero, apparently by these two equations, one and two, that means that y is zero. And now by the fourth equation, if x and y are zero, if either x or y is zero, apparently z squared is minus one. And now I'm in trouble, unless I can identify something else that I've missed here. Z squared equals minus one is a dead end. We're talking about the calculus only of real variables. And so Z squared equals minus one. Well, the solution, sure, Z is plus or minus I, but that's not a point in space, at least not a point in real space. Now you're gonna have fun someday redoing calculus with complex numbers entirely. It's actually quite fun. But right now we're sticking to real numbers. We don't see a solution down this branch. Unless we're missing something, unless I made some obvious mistake, but we'll come back and look at that. So now let's go back to this branch right here. Let's say lambda y equals 2x. That was the first equation. Second equation, lambda x equals 2y. And fourth equation was xy equals 1. So I can solve the fourth equation for x or y. But remember, I'd be dividing by x, dividing by y, which would make x or y 0. Now, I've got some evidence possibly over here that x or y equals 0 actually turns out to be no answer. So I might not be afraid to divide by 0. But remember, I'm on a different branch. So I don't want to make that commitment yet. I'd rather show you the trick that we talked about earlier. Let's take the first equation and multiply both sides by x. So I am not dividing the second equation multiply both sides by y. I'm creating factors, and factors create cases. Now I can equate lambda xy and lambda xy. And that says 2x squared equals 2y squared. Well, x squared equals y squared. And if you like, you can subtract y squared and factor that into x plus y and x minus y equals zero. Or you can say, I'll take the square root of both sides. Absolute value of x is absolute value of y. But the result is either y is x or y is minus x. Now remember, that's in the system right here. So let's take the fact that y is x. Well, that would mean that x squared is 1. And that would mean that x is plus or minus 1. Good. Keep following this branch. Now we split into x equals 1, x equals minus 1. If x is 1, then y is 1. And z on this branch, remember, was 0. So here we've got a real possibility. x is 1, y is 1, z is 0. Let's look at x equals minus 1. If x is equal to minus 1, then y is equal to minus 1. And if x and y are minus 1, then their product is 1. That's good. I'm on the branch z equals 0. And there's another possibility. But do you see I've also got two branches right here. If y is minus x, then what happens in this equation? If y and x are opposite, don't I have things to examine over here? Well, think about it for a second. If y and x are opposite, then minus x squared is 1. And again, I run into the same problem I had before. This is not a real number solution. I'm not examining this case. This is not a point in space. There is no point in space where x squared is minus 1 in real space. So this is a dead end. I guess there, I was thinking maybe I'd get two branches. No. So let's look at this problem. 
branched into two pieces, dead end. Uh, I need to draw a scroll, skull and crossbones, maybe. Here, this one branched into two pieces. This piece was a dead end. But this piece branched into two pieces. And I had two points to examine. One, one, zero. Minus one, minus one, zero. Since these are the only things I've done and I followed every branch that I legitimately created, I haven't missed any branches because the very way I started only prevent, presented me with these two branches. Now I check the value of F at both of these points. Here the value of F is two. Remember F was X squared, was Y squared, was Z squared. And here the value of F is also two. So now remember, F was the square of the distance. So I say the minimum distance is root two and at the points one, one, zero, and minus one, minus one, zero. So what we got right here is we found the points that are closest to the origin on this surface. Now I haven't answered the question. Uh, how do I know that that extreme value I just found is not the maximum distance to the origin? And logically, I think I can find points on x, y equals z squared plus one that are much farther away than root two. I could just manipulate points here to get things that are much farther away. Uh, let's try something like x equals 10 and y equals 10. Then I get 100. And z squared is 99. Uh, even if I factor out the 9, that's 3 root 11. Now this point is clearly on the surface. And what's its distance from the origin? 100 plus 100 plus square this, you get 99 square rooted. So that's the square root of 299. That is clearly larger distance from the origin than that is. So could root two be the maximum distance to the origin? No, not at all. <laughs> and then I start to wonder, well, couldn't I made this larger by doing 100, 100, and then manipulating the Z again? Yes. So what do I suspect, even though I haven't drawn this? I suspect that as my surface goes out, out, out to infinity, maybe I can always find larger and larger points on the surface. Maybe it was impossible to ask for maximum distance without further constraints. And the Lagrange multiplier naturally found the only optimal points possible, which were the minimum distance. Now that depends on my physical understanding of the surface. So we're actually going to draw the surface when we come back. We'll take a break now and show you what the surface is. In fact, it's a recognizable surface. And show you these two points that are the closest possible to the origin. And show you that there's no points on the surface that could be absolute farthest distance from the origin. Because the surface goes on and on forever unless I constrained it further. Okay, this is the Lagrange multiplier problem. This problem I call medium. I call medium because the tree here wasn't too full of branches. You could have problems where there's many more branches going on. Okay, I'm gonna label this. I'm gonna set a time to come back and then we will actually 
draw this surface of Mathematica so you can visualize it. But let's say right now we'll come back at, and what do we got here? 58, let's be generous, 904. And then we're gonna move on into multiple integrals after we graph this surface. Okay, I'm gonna mute my microphone while I stretch my legs. I recommend you do the same.
Okay, we're back and we're moving on to the next topic, which is multiple integrals. But before we do that, I'd like to invite you to visualize the surface and see if we can come up with a nice demonstration that we've actually found the minimum distance. So I am going to, excuse me, I'm gonna quit Mathematica, make sure my variables are initialized. There's other ways to initialize the variables inside there. But let me open a fresh Mathematica sheet and then I will share it with you. And we're gonna put in this surface and constraint. So new document, let me get the thing pumped up in size. Uh, let me just put a little title on it. Oh, I don't think I need to make this too fancy. And then I'll share it with you. So let's look at this and see if we can illustrate what we have here. We have a function, which is x comma y. And we're going to define this function. Now remember, we're reserving the variables x and y to be the input in the function. And it was x times y minus z raised to the 2. No, oh, that was the constraint function. So let's make this g. And we were trying to maximize f of x and y. Oh, let's not forget about z. Lowercase c will be sufficient. So we're just getting this all cleaned up and happy. And Mathematica isn't color coding things that are red. And why is that? Because it's really confused about my presentation here. So I got to get my syntax cleaned up and in place before Mathematica can try to understand what I'm writing. Okay, now Mathematica understands what I'm writing. And the only thing is it colored F and G blue because it says you haven't formally executed these lines yet. So let's formally execute these lines. Okay, now let's do plot. Uh, let's do contour plot. I could solve for z and plot, but let's contour plot the surface f. Ah, the surface is g. The constraint is g, isn't it? Contour plot 3d, g of x comma y comma z. And let's just look casually in a certain region of space. Let's say the region of space is x comma minus six to six. And then we will select y and z to be the same. I will indent so that we can make this more readable. Cutting and pasting is your friend. And what else do I have to say about this? This is going to give me a raw plot, so let's execute it, and then we can clean it up. Ah, what Mathematica did is gave me, in its usual Mathematica overachiever style, is gave me many surfaces that might be level surfaces of this function. depending on what I set the value of g equal to. And then I remember I was interested in the value of g is one. Okay, Mathematica says, okay, then you're talking about this. Then you're talking about this. Does this look familiar yet? What this is, twisted and turned sideways, is a hyperboloid of two sheets. Notice what would happen if I had set g equal to minus one. I would have got a hyperboloid of one sheet, right? So I get different things based on the constraints, but here I have a hyperboloid of two sheets. And let's put, uh, let's start to decorate this a bit. Let's say axes uh, equals true. Let's say axes origin is, zero, 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 
that's setting the place where I want to put my number line. And what do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Contour plot. It's options other than an option must be a rule or set of rules. So why is it upset about axes and axes origin? Well, we're going to have to reserve that. So I'll wait on that. But I'm going to copy this because I think I'm going to paste it later. I'll cut this out. Okay, so it's clear that if the origin is somewhere inside here in between these, that the closest point would be on the tips of these hyperloid of two sheets. It's kind of bumpy here, isn't it? So maybe I'm going to say, let's say points or plot points. Pump that up so I get a little smoother graph. Let's hope it doesn't get angry about that. It's a little bit smoother. I could actually mark the origin and I can mark the two points that I'm talking about, but I think we see that I found my closest points, but I wanna illustrate the closest points in another way. So let's call this constraint. And now let's build a sphere with a contour plot. Plot 3D. And, and the sphere will be x raised to the 2 plus y raised to the 2 plus z raised to the 2 equals what? So what is the distance from the origin of the two points I found it was root 2. So let's look at the sphere x squared plus y squared equals 2. Let's do it over the same space, x, y, c minus 6 to 6. Uh, what do we got going on right here? I got something trying to draw this, but x squared plus y squared plus z squared is protected. OK, so obviously something went wrong because I didn't get a sphere. x squared plus y squared plus z squared is protected. I, uh, what does that mean? Well, I'm, I'm glad you protected it. But I think what happened is I'm forgetting to say mathematical equals here. So I'm just illustrating that these are all the things you're gonna do when you bump into this. Oh, I got a sphere. Why is that sphere so bumpy? Because I told Mathematica to look in space from minus six to six, minus six to six, minus six to six. Mathematica sampled points in that whole giant box and only found a few near the origin that actually made that sphere, right? So I could tell Mathematica to super pump up more points, but then it's still evaluating things very, very far away from the origin as far as we're concerned. So why don't we rather work on my X, Y, Z? Let's make this minus three to three, since I think I know what region I'm looking at. And then maybe Mathematica won't waste so much energy. Okay, good, good. The ball and the sphere look pretty decent there. I could even do the plot points 30 because that didn't seem to be too expensive as far as time or resources. What I really want to do, of course, is put these two together. So let's suppress output with a semicolon and then say show constraint and sphere. And there is the sphere at the origin. And I see my problem now is what? I'm growing spheres at the origin. And the first sphere that touches the surface will identify the closest point. And do you see that the spheres normal vectors, I didn't draw them here, but you imagine them. At the point where the sphere kisses this parabola of two sheets does what? The spheres normal vector and the parabola of two sheets normal vectors at that moment would line up. So that's the magic moment where this would line up. This is a nice illustration of three dimensions. If I wanna make this illustration more exciting, what could I do? I could use manipulate to say, 
let's let the sphere grow. So I think I'm overdoing it here because I want to move on to other things. But let's say the sphere should be parameterized by A and we'll set A equal to our radius. Now I'm creating a function in A. I have to reserve the A for a variable. I'm creating a function in A right here. Why is it not writing the A as a variable? I'm nervous about the output of that. A is protected. See, I always run into this situation. So what is A being used for in my sheets? I'm not sure. Let's try R. So that means somehow I've assigned the value A to something. R is protected. Okay, I think I haven't set this equal to. There we go. I didn't say I was defining a function. So I think the A would be okay too. Okay, now I've defined a function of spheres of different radiuses. And now let's do spheres of different radiuses. But I have to supply the A if I'm gonna make this thing animate. So what was the animation command? Manipulate. Let's add my indentations to make this easier to read. Read, and I'll run A from uh, zero to two. And what do we got here? We got some other person that's unhappy. So. Why is it unhappy? I need to check out what sphere did. So let's say sphere of two. Does that actually produce a sphere? Yes, it does. It's this funny notation next to it. So why is it misinterpreting my command right there? Sphere of radius two, plot points 30, contour plot 3D. So this is a problem why you don't just do things on the fly like this. I mean, I'm logically creating something that should be reasonable, but apparently I'm not using the correct Mathematica notation. It's trying to think about drawing different spheres here. And it's giving me error messages I could decode but I'm not interested in decoding them right now. So unless I see something obvious, I think I have to move on. Sphere constraint A, it shouldn't bother with the name of this variable. It's still upset. So for some reason, I'm misidentifying or mislabeling a variable. Maybe you could play with this and create an animation that you would find exciting, and then you bring it to me, okay? But you see my goal here is to create an animation where I watch the ball grow in radius. As I move the K here, I'm creating a number, but I'm not creating a ball that grows in radius. So what I'm going to do is get out of that. I'm, I, I always want to know what went wrong, right? And I want to say, let me make this smaller so I can fit more on screen. Maybe I'm double using the word sphere here. I don't know what I'm doing, but nothing productive. So I'm going to move on and let you create a nice manipulation for this. Okay. You could always say that that's um, kind of a cop out or a kind of an excuse making. So maybe it's time for you to make the animation. So you learn by building things yourself. So what are we going to talk about when we talk about multiple integrals? You've done a lot of integrals and integration. And in some sense, multiple integrals is just repeated integration. Well, what does it represent? What can we do with this? And what's the proper way to set these up? 
And now this will return to this discussion about describing this triangle in the plane. So first I'm gonna make a very broad and general, but a very important statement that I want you to remember as we work throughout this chapter. A definite integral is a length an area, a volume, or the contribution, I'm going to use some fancy language, of a function There too. Let's understand this sentence. A definite integral is a length, an area, a volume, or the contribution of a function there too. So a very simple example. Let's take the definite integral from one to three dx. Now you could interpret that in two different ways. You could interpret that as, let's take the line between one and three, let's chop it up into little pieces called dx, and let's sum all the little pieces. And if you cut this interval from one to three into little tiny pieces, and then summed up the length dx of all the little tiny pieces, well, of course, that integral is two. So here a definite integral represents a length. But you know another way to represent this definite integral. You could have rather said, oh, this is the definite integral from one to three of one dx. And in that interpretation, what you're looking at between one and three is a very boring function of height one. And now you understand the integral from one to three, the definite integral from one to three, you've understood this from your calculus class, as the area of this brick. Now we're not gonna get surprised or upset by the result because the area of the brick is a brick of two units of width and one unit of height. The area of that brick is two units. But you understand that these are two length units in the first example. And these are two area units in the second example. Now let's look at this example. Let's say I put a function in here like x squared. And let's play the same game. So you have the freedom to interpret this first integral as a length or an area. A definite integral is a length, an area, or a volume. Now let's look at this in two different ways. You say, I don't think there's two ways to look at this. Well, let's try it out. There's one and three. We know what the function x squared looks like. It goes from one to nine. So I'll draw that in units that please myself. And I'll draw that parabola section from one to nine. And I'll do the traditional calculus thing. I will shade this and say to myself, I must be asking for the area under this curve from one to three. It's not hard to work that out because you know how to perform integrals. And the result is 27 over three, which is nine, minus one over three, which is one third. And so we get here 
26 over 3. And you understand that to be area. Okay, very good. Congratulations. But I want to give you another interpretation. What about the length interpretation? You say you can't measure this as length. Ah, but what if my other interpretation is of a solid rod that extends on the x-axis from one to three and gets more and more dense as I move to the right-hand side at three. What if this function x squared, f of x equals x squared, represented density, mass per unit length? Now, it's not, I don't want to think about this in a very fancy way yet, because we'll talk about density and center of mass later. But let's just say very, very grad, very, very uh, casually that this rod is denser and heavier. Heavy is a talk about force. Mass is something else. I understand force and mass are different, but either way you want to look at it, it's heavier as I move towards the right-hand side of this rod. And the function that describes the density is x squared. Well, now how do you understand this 26 thirds? This 26 thirds is cutting the rod up into little pieces dx and using x squared dx as what? The mass of that little piece. So dm is x squared dx. And then when I integrate x squared dx from one to three, I'm actually adding up from one to three the mass of that rod. And now I know the mass is 26 thirds. 26 thirds mass units, whatever mass units are. And from there, I can go to center of mass and things like that all day long. So here's what I said about this sentence. A definite integral is a length, an area, here's an area, or I want to say it like this, the definite integral from A to B of F dx is the contribution of the function F to the length from A to B. contribution of the function f to the length from x equals 1 to x equals 3 on the x-axis. I scribbled that kind of poorly. Now here's what this opens. Here's the door that this opens for you. You have practiced doing many integrals and sometimes you assign meaning to the integrals and sometimes you just did them for the sheer fun of doing integrals. But we're gonna talk much more now about the meaning of doing the integrals. And so the building of meaning is, begins with this statement. A definite integral is a length and area of volume or the contribution of a function thereto. I haven't illustrated volume yet, but I do know that you did volumes with definite integrals before, didn't you? You took volumes even in your previous calculus class, where what you did is you said, I will identify the cross-sectional area based on, let's call this the x-axis, and I will run x from A to B. And if I add up the cross-sectional area times the thickness of the cross-section, 
what I'm doing is finding the volume of an object by adding up little volume layers. So there's a single integral where you add up little volume pieces to create volume. Is this definite integral a volume? Or is this definite integral a contribution of area to length? Do you understand you can say it both ways? And when you understand that you can say it both ways, then that opens you up, it opens your mind to having new interpretations of what integration is. Okay, so now let's do a practice example. <clears throat> let's find the area of triangle. And let's take this famous thing that we brought at the beginning with vertices of zero, 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 four, and five, zero. And I'm not picking this out because it's sneaky or difficult. I'm picking it out because the simplicity of the problem is gonna allow us to illustrate this very interesting concept. Now, you know that the area of that triangle is 10, because you know all things about triangles, right? One half base times height. I mean, you could kill this in many different ways. You could think of it as a brick. It's four by five, whose area is 20, but the triangle is half the brick. So you have many geometric arguments at your disposal, but you also have calculus argument. Let's take this function, which is minus, four fifths x plus four. And let's integrate it from x equals zero to x equals five. And I hope that turns out to be 10. I'm not gonna do that one right now. But I want you to open your mind to another interpretation. What if we wrote this as a double integral? Let's think of this triangle, this region R, as a triangular cookie or a thin, in physics, sometimes they use the word lamina. Lamina is a sheet that has no particular thickness except what we assign. So this is a little triangular cookie, flat cookie, Christmas cookie, Christmas cookie for a mathematician. And what I'm gonna do is break this Christmas cookie into little area bits as if I intended to share it with someone else. But I have no intention of sharing this cookie. And then I will write this double integral to say, let's chop up triangle into many area pieces, and then let's add up all the area pieces. Why do I write a double integral? Why not just a single integral? Because what I'm gonna do is, is I have to acknowledge that the region R is a two-dimensional region. In order to describe R, I'm going to have to use two variables. In fact, I did use two variables here in a sense, I'm just hiding the y inside this formula. Now let's go to the parameterization that I gave at the beginning of class. Let's represent this. Now, by the way, this is one dA. So is this an area or a volume? Let's think about that in a second. But I am going to allow the x's and the y's to run, and I'm gonna write it differently than I did above. Let's run the y's from zero to four. And for every y from zero to four, I will pick out x's and let them run from what? x equals zero to x equals line. 
course, if I say x equals line, I have to write that line in terms of x. And we know that line equation is 4x plus 5y is 20. So I can solve this for x reasonably well. I will let all the x variables run from 0 to minus 5 fourths xy. Solve this for x, then x equals minus 5 fourths y plus 5. Now this is a classic setting limits on a double integral. I am painting this region. And I'm creating little area units called dx times dy. Little bit of x distance, little bit of y distance, create a little bit of area. That's the dA. And I'm integrating that with a function one from these two variables. And let's see what happens. Well, first we integrate on the inside. And this is x from y equals I'm sorry, from x equals 0 to x equals minus 5 fourths y plus 5. And then after I evaluate that, I'll integrate with respect to y from 0 to 4. Now, uh, do you see what I did is rewrote this problem because I want you to go and do this integral yourself and find out that it's 10. I don't think it's hard to do that integral. But I want to show you that I could look at it from the perspective of the y-axis first. So now, when I put these two things in, I put in 5 fourths y plus 5. I put in 0. I subtract. Now I'm integrating 0 to 4. <coughs> Excuse me. That's 5 fourths y plus 5, dy. And this we integrate minus 5 eighths y squared plus 5y. We evaluate that from 0 to 4. And what we get is 16 divided by 8 is 2. So that's minus 10 plus 20. When we put in 0, we get 0, 0. Fundamental theorem of calculus says I subtract it. And now I know that that area is 10. So I didn't learn anything I didn't know from calculus one, right? Or did I? I learned that I could describe that as summing areas instead of just summing. This was summing of little rectangle heights in calculus one. Now I sum little area pieces. What's the value of that? Let's think about this. Is that 10 represent Area or volume? You know, I could just as easily say it represents volume. Let's put a five here. Let's put a four on the y-axis. Let's draw the triangle. And let's study this one. The one says, I want you to give a thickness to that triangle. And now this triangle has a thickness of one. And now this 10 represents a volume of 10. So this is 10 volume units, 10 cubic units, whatever my units are. Here it was 10 area. Here it was 10 square units. So do you remember the phrase that I introduced? A definite integral, I'm putting limits on it, that's what's called definite integral, is either a length, an area, or a volume, or the contribution of a function thereto. So now I showed you that this integral can be both considered to be an area and a volume. But now you know what I'm about to do. What if, for that same region R, I introduced a function called x squared y4. And I give this function the power to contribute to the area that describes that triangle. 
well, what would I necessarily have here? Now, I am could say, oh, let's draw this surface above the triangle. And then I will see what volume I created. That's looking at the volume interpretation. Or I could say the double integral is the density of this Christmas cookie. I'm not very good at making Christmas cookies. So sometimes the dough doesn't come out very even. And some parts of the dough and the cookie are denser than others. And it's sometimes a threat to my teeth. Maybe this Christmas cookie has different density at different place on the Christmas cookie. And then what does this volume represent? Oh, well, this double integral could be a volume or it could be a mass. Now, to execute this double integral, let's keep the same limits as I did before. Zero to four. Zero to minus five-fourths y plus five dx dy. And now let's put in x squared y fourth. What I want to say to you is you have the tools to execute this double integral, but you might not enjoy it. Really what we're doing here is partial integration. I, nobody calls it that, but don't you see that first you're gonna integrate with respect to x and consider y to be constant? Then you're gonna put these limits in for x. And then after you sort out that whole mess, then you're going to integrate again with respect to y. So if I integrate it with respect to x here, I'd have one third x cubed, y fourth. It's like doing the opposite of partial differentiation. And then I'd have to plug in these points, minus five fourths, these values, five. And if I survived that, then I can integrate now with respect to y from zero to four. Now I give that to you as an assignment because uh, I don't look forward to doing this, but all it's gonna do is create a polynomial in y and you guys have evaluated many polynomials in y and x and t and whatever other letter makes you excited. But I'm excited about the interpretation of this object. So just for kicks, I'm going to run this into Mathematica and find out what that integral would be. Just to show you that you can use uh, Mathematica to do that illustration. Uh, first, I'm going to get rid of this failure of the manipulate. What we have here is a failure to manipulate. What famous movie? Use that as its tagline for all you movie buffs out there. Well, let me drag this over here. Actually, the, 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 the tagline for the movie was, uh, it could be equally applicable to a math class. What we have here is a failure to communicate. Maybe you've never seen that movie, it's a classic movie. So let's go over here. Let's forget about the Lagrange multiplier problem. And let's write a multiple integral for a function called x squared times y to the fourth. Frankly, I could just type this in. It's not a function of z anymore. I could just type this into my multiple integral, but I want you to see the notation a little bit. So now I want you to integrate. F of x comma y with the limits, what? X equals or comma zero comma minus five force Y plus five. Let's just see what Mathematica makes of this. And Mathematica creates a crazy polynomial in Y. 
I'm not going to get any numerical answer here because I haven't done the summing in the y direction now. I've only summed with respect to x. So now let's sum again by, well, let me undo this, integrating again. And this time when I integrate, I'm going to insert this integral. So this is multiple integration. But I'm going to have to add some y limits here. Let's go y from 0 to 4. Got it. Let's indent so that you can visualize what's happening. Do I have enough brackets? I actually do have enough brackets, don't I? Because this first integrate is right here. And then the second integrate is right there. Let's see what we get. 3,200 over 21. Uh, we could do this numerically in a couple of ways. I could do n integrate, which is numerical integration. Oh, okay, it doesn't like n integrate in the inside integral because I'm using variables. So there's n integrate only on the outside. I could, anytime I want to force a floating point number, just put in a decimal somewhere. There's the number right there. But I want to visualize this volume. So let's plot 3D and let's say f of x comma y. And let's take my x and y descriptions that I had here. You see how this relates to the question that I said was asked earlier? Let's see if I can plot this in a nice way. Uh, not machine tested. So what we have to do here is we have to describe, possibly it wants us to describe y first. If that doesn't work, then we'll do the region function. Yes, over this triangle, let's look at this function. It's shooting through the roof right here. And what I'm calculating is the area under this function. Now, I'm kind of curious as why Mathematica said, let's show it to you only up to 80. So I want to add some X and Y and Z ranges to this. Let me say plot range. goes from, uh, let's just see if I can say, excuse me. Let's do some indentation so you can focus on what we're writing. Plot range from uh, zero to 200. Does it allow me just to specify the Z plot range? Oh yes, it does. Okay, that's wonderful. Now I can see this volume. I can do a plot style of, let's try opacity of 0 0.4. And the reason I want to do some opacity is because I'm going to do a fancier uh, thing here called fill in, filling bottom. And it kind of draws me the region underneath here is kind of shading. What it does is it kind of creates a shading underneath that surface. So here, I want to pose a question to you. Uh, let me see how I want to rewrite this. Did I just calculate the volume of this funny mountain? Or did I just calculate, let's add a color function. And let's say color function hue. Or did I just calculate the density of my Christmas cookie? 
the mass of my Christmas cookie, plot style. And let's do plot style more. Let's do plot style background, remove lighting, viewpoint above. Here's my Christmas cookie when viewed from above. Now, there's an oblique reference here, so I want to viewpoint above orthographic projection. Now, I'm looking at my Christmas cookie, and the red parts are the less dense parts, and the blue parts are the very dense parts. Maybe I have a lump of something over here, a lump of coal, perhaps. And now, what does the 152 mean? Does the 152.381 mean the volume of this cute mountain? Or does the 152.381 mean the mass of this Christmas cookie? See now that you have the freedom to do both. This is really, really powerful. Now the trick was in some sense, describing the limits of integration. And so this is gonna be the challenge for you as I release you now today. When you do section 5.1, there's a big pile of problems that just make you practice doing multiple integration. First integrate with respect to Y, then integrate with respect to X, then do it with respect to X, then do it with respect to Y. Uh, sometimes if you switch the order of integration, a problem can go from impossible to simple. But the issue is almost always you learning how to set the limits. You watched me set the limits on some simple problems. So you learn to set the limits and you interpret the limits as equations that your variables run from one side to the other. That is the hardest challenge in doing multiple integrals. So you can think about an area as the contribution of one to an area unit, or you can think about the area as the contribution of a function to a line. You can think about the volume as a triple integral, we're not gonna to touch triple integrals yet, or you could think about it as contribution of a height to an area, or as you did in Calc 2 when you sliced volumes, slicing method, you can think of it as a contribution of an area to a height. So I want you to practice setting limits and evaluating multiple integrals here in section 5.1. The hardest thing to do is to set the limits. So that's where you focus your most attention. But if you have some time, you know, toss in, uh, toss in a uh, few visualizations in mathematics to help you see what you're doing. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this mathematical worksheet. I'm gonna go back to my paper. Or if I can find my window. Okay, very good. So, you know, what this turned out to be, let me just write down what this turned out to be for everybody's sake of uh, completeness. And I, got, I gotta go and find the number, don't I? About 152.381, but it was 3,200 over 21, if I was not mistaken. Let me double check that. Yes, that's what it was. This is the exact answer. Of course, this is an exact answer. Well, you, you investigate. This is an approximation here because of the divided by 21. But this represents the volume under that curve that you saw, or does it represent mass? It represents both. 
Okay. So I'm going to let you go here. I'm going to stop the recording. And if you have a question, you're welcome to stay and ask a question. But then I got to move over to some other office hours.